My name is uh, Cyril Baron. I've been in the industry for about uh, 20 years. Uh, I had the first part of my life in publishing, marketing, working for Atari, Infogram, and then I switched to production and joined actually Ubisoft Dusseldorf in 2012, so about uh, seven years ago. Uh, Ubisoft Dusseldorf is actually part of Ubisoft Blue Byte. We are one of the oldest studio in uh, Germany. Uh, we are doing a bit uh, older type of product that Ubisoft is doing, so big codev on the big uh, brand of Ubisoft. We have some PC brand, maybe, you know, Anno, you know, Settlers, and we love innovation. And actually, so Ubisoft Escape Game is one of our innovation projects. It's coming out of uh, Ubisoft Dusseldorf. Basically, our mandate is to create virtual reality escape games in the best gaming world of Ubisoft. And we have actually released two experiences already. The first one is called Escape the Lost Pyramid. It's actually uh, based in the world of Assassin's Creed Origin, and we released that in July 18. And we just released a couple of months ago a second experience called Beyond Medusa's Gate, which is also an escape game set this time in the world of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, so back in ancient Greece. What's special about our games, at least for Ubisoft, is we are doing them exclusively for location-based entertainment businesses. So our, our clients are actually physical escape rooms. They are VR arcades or they are whatever outlets specialize in entertainment. So we have some family entertainment center, we've got some laser tag, etc. Something also which is a bit special in our project is we are actually controlling the distribution. What I mean by that is we do not have distributors. We actually want to have a one-on-one -on -one relation with every single partner. And we are currently building this network because in LBE, it's very important to have very good partners and having this line of communication is super important for us. So you know a bit what we are doing and what I would like to start with is to tell you about, about our, uh, our journey into VR. Uh, actually, we operate a bit like a small startup within Ubisoft. So you see all the teams, there are the 21 guys at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen, we are very small, we need to be very fast. Uh, we want to change the world a bit like a startup. It actually started back in uh, 2017. I think uh, submitted a concept to our editorial team in Paris about doing escape uh, room in VR. And they actually liked it. And they told us, you know what? Maybe it's a good idea. We're going to give you a small uh, prototype budget, build a team and try to prove to us that it could be interesting. So we had three months to create this first prototype. And then we presented it to Serge, Serge Asquet, who is our chief creative uh, officer in Ubisoft. And he said, you know what? I like it, guys. So please go and start doing the first game, which we started back in October uh, 2017. So at the time, we were uh, 10 devs. And we actually released, so Escape the Lost Pyramid, our first game uh, at the end of June in 2018. And by the time of release, we were actually eight, uh, 16 on the team. So still very fast. And uh, actually, our first client started operating our game on the 1st of July 2019. Immediately, the team started to work on the uh, second game. And at the same time, we were trying to find new partners to, uh, to uh, distribute and operate our games. Uh, this year, in February, we actually reached 100 partners worldwide. Uh, in May, as I've told you, we released our uh, second game. July, we reached 200 partners. Uh, we think we are the market leaders. There's no official data, but uh, our reach is quite important. And currently, all the team is currently working on our third room, which is not going to be based this time on Assassin's Creed and that we are going to release uh, actually next spring. And if we find one or two missing people we want in the team, we should be 23 by the time of release. So as you can see, or at least for Ubisoft, we are a very small team and we have a very small uh, uh, development uh, schedule. Basically, what it means is that from the get-go, especially when we were 10, we had to make lots of uh, production choices to make sure we could deliver on time and quality. And so basically, <coughs> what we decided is that our experience are going to be room scale only. And from the get-go, we say it's going to be exclusively for location-based VR. Uh, it was great because for us, it means we could have a uh, the same uh, minimum specs for every single partner. So we did not have to spend as much time to do optimization if you want to cover lots of different pieces. And at the time, so it was two years ago, we said that we will support uh, Rift and actually HTC Vive. And that's uh, today is still the two 
devices that we are supporting because our partners who have started, we want to make sure that they can uh, continue to exploit our games uh, year, years after years. Also, what we uh, decided from the get-go is that it's going to be multiplayer only, and actually it's going to be or two or four players. Why two or four players? Because we said, if we want to do four, we are going to do two times two, so we are going to do twice the experience, we're going to mirror it, because in terms of uh, uh, design, it would be easier and we would be able to actually do that in time. We also said that it's going to be a one-time experience. There was a lot of discussion about, can you make it replayable? But it's difficult to do an escape room in a replayable way because it's all about discovering. It would require too much time for not enough, I think, value. And we said, no, we are not going to do that. It's going to be a one-time experience only. And if we are very fast in developing one game, it's better to try to do more than one than trying to do actually replayability. And for our first and second game, we also said, okay, we're not going to have NPCs in the game because we, had, uh, we have no animator. It's more difficult and we won't be able to do it on time. So see from the very beginning, very strong choices. At the same time, we have some uh, very agile production method. So basically the first thing and one of the most important was having the right people. And basically uh, all the people I've got in the team are people who have a very let's do it mindset, you know. We just do the prototype, we put it in the game, it needs to work. So basically we had a, a very, we have a very flat hierarchy in the team overall. Um, it's all about weekly sprints. We need to be always playable. And we started with a very light project management Kanban system, which has evolved a bit now that we are more, but it's still the same uh, philosophy. <coughs> also one thing is that we, uh, uh, decided very early on, and I think it was a very good uh, decision, is actually, if it's a one-time experience that is going to be played outside, we're going to do one-time playtest. So we're lucky because we are in a big studio, so we are about more than 200 in uh, Dusseldorf, so we organized a big contest within the company where a group of four could actually apply. And since before Alpha, actually people were coming, playing the game, so basically we were able to measure and iterate and actually see what was happening. And that's when, when we started VR, we understood actually what matters is not what you see or what you see as a dev on screen, it's about what you feel. And making sure that we had all these playtests from very early on actually gave us lots of uh, knowledge and confidence about the quality of the experience when it was uh, released outside. So let's talk about how do we create business-to-business uh, -business experiences uh, for mainstream consumers. Because one thing is clear is that our audience is actually very mainstream. Uh, if you know escape room, escape room are for everybody. It's for all ages, all people. You go there as a family, you go there with your grandmother, you go there as a company, it can be a corporate event. So you can go with your boss, with your colleague. So basically, uh, it's also for people who have no VR experience most of the time. Sometimes they don't have video game experience. So thinking about accessibility from the very beginning, was one of our core principles. So, and you can also see that we've also been testing uh, at Blue Byte with uh, people in wheelchair because accessibility, we understand it's key. And at the same time that we have this, uh, in terms of audience, we know that if you do location-based entertainment, you have some constraints from the business side. One of them is on the business side, uh, customers are going to book a 60-minute session, especially in VR arcade, which means that you actually have only 60 minutes to learn the game and finish it. So you really need to think from the beginning about onboarding the players, how do you finish, and how you're going to give tools to your partners, the operator, to manage all the different players. So this is what we had in mind when we started, and we say, okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? <coughs> One of the first things we we were wondering is, why do you go out of home? Because it's not going to be played in, uh, at your place, you're, you're going to have to go out. And basically, if you go out of home, it's because you want to meet friends, most likely you're going to meet colleagues, maybe you go out with your family. So that's right from the very beginning, we say it has to be multiplayer. Uh, and here you can see one of the setup is all two or four players, so that's a four player setup. So the game was going to be multiplayer. And I think if you uh, listen to your arcade and local and entertainment doing VR, they tell you that 90% of the game which are played are actually multiplayer games. So I think it, 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 it was a very important decision. And what we wanted to do is to make sure there was a very strong 
collaboration in the game. So if you go as a group, you want to make sure that all together you're going to be working well. And so basically what I'm going to show you is uh, some uh, video of a group of four uh, players actually in the game. They are talking to uh, actually one another and they understand that they have to do it together. Otherwise, they are not going to make it. So please pay attention more to what they say than what you see. Can you stay on the bridge too? So see, because when I slowly the foot down, maybe you need to stay too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh nice. You have to work together, guys, right? You've heard the guy said, oh, we have to work together, guys, right? And it's correct. It's one of the really core principles of our experience. And one of the rules we, we have is you cannot solve the game on your own. If you don't escape room, physical escape room, Sometimes you are in a group where somebody is very fast in picking up everything. He finds the logs, he does everything for you. So you're watching, but you say, oh, okay. So you feel a bit outside. And what we wanted to do is at the end of every single experience, anybody from the team should be able to say, guys, without me, you would not have done it. And it's important because when you go as a group and you have the satisfaction, it means that when you come back home or when you go back to work on Monday, you're going to say that you've done something for your team and you're going to talk about it. Uh, so that was one of the core rules that we've got. Also, what we wanted to do if you go out of home is we wanted you to do something that, you're, that you cannot do actually in your living room. So of course, it's larger than your living room. So in our game, if you have four players, you need four room scale. So you're not going to be able to do that at home or at least not a lot of home are going to be able to do that. But what was important for us is to be larger than life. And I think that what we are offers you, it offers you to transport people to different places. So again, pay attention to what people are saying. Is that at class? So imagine, you know, you, you go back to work on Monday. What you can say is, oh, together we were with my three friends, we were on a boat in this massive underground cave and we had the giant statues of Atlas above us. That's the type of emotion that you want to give actually to a player. So we want them to experience something larger than life. We want them to do something that you actually cannot do in real life. Maybe because it's too difficult maybe because it's just impossible or too dangerous. And again, that's what uh, people are doing. So you're not going to see what they've done, but basically they have to climb something which is quite steep and they are actually commenting on it. I wish that climbing was that easy in real life. And yes, it's amazing. I think when people actually do that and they've got this feeling of doing something incredible, it brings actually uh, satisfaction uh, to, to the experience that you are doing. So this was one of our principles of everything we do. We want to be larger than life. We want to be, uh, yeah, to enable you to do something you cannot do in real life. And at the same time, because of our audience, we need to make it accessible to actually everyone. So how do, how do we do that? What were our... Um, or uh, design guideline. First, uh, we are non-violent. What does that mean? That even though we are set in the world of Assassin's Creed, you're not playing as an assassin. You're not going to assassinate anybody. And I think it's valuable because we have lots of feedback from partners, your arcade saying, you know, it's good to have a game where you can put anybody, you're not going to kill anybody, which is positive. And we think it was important, especially for our target audience. Second, what we've done, and it's probably one of the best decisions we made, even though it was not a decision we, we've done from the get-go, is we are giving you a full body avatar. So one of the first things you do when you arrive in the game, you're going to be in a lobby all together. You have your avatar and you see yourself. There is a mirror. So if you wave at the mirror, you're going to see you're waving. And actually, this is the moment where people who have not done VR are sold on VR. Because at that moment, they understand, oh, but that's not just a video game. That's not a gaming console. That's incredible, that's actually me. And we can see each other, people can talk. You've got some accessories, they've got ads, so they can take the hat and they say, how do I put it on? 
and you tell them, well, how do you do in real life? Oh, and you put it on and say, wow, it's incredible, it's working. And I was saying it was not an obvious decision because when we started, we had no animator. So basically, you're not tracking the feet. So yeah, if you look at the animation, it's not perfect at all, far from that, but it doesn't matter. Actually, the benefit of having a full body is so much better than actually it's really selling a VR to actually customers. So I really recommend people who are not sure about having a real body avatar, it's really worth it because it's really making people uh, enjoy the experience a lot. <coughs> then, if you want to be mainstream, you need to be as natural as possible. So of course, uh, as you can, you've seen, people are talking. Well, you don't need a tutorial to talk. Uh, when we do bow shooting, we put a, a bow in the world. We put an arrow, and I think anybody understands that if you grab the bow, grab an arrow, put it in, and shoot, it's working. You don't need a tutorial. It, it's, it's, it's magical. Uh, climbing is a bit more difficult, but people get it. So, uh, and because we had room scale, you actually don't need to learn really locomotion, so it was quite natural. And actually, we have just two tutorials in the game. One is for grabbing, so we are telling you to uh, press the uh, trigger to actually grab an object. And the second one I'm going to talk to you about. So at the same time, even though we had um, room scale, and natural walking, uh, what we decided also is to give you in each game a kind of moving platform for you. So we could actually transport you in a much bigger world uh, to make sure that you would see more of the universe. And now I'm going to show you. So you've seen that in Medusa, which has all the extracts you've seen, you are actually on a boat. So you've got your boat with your mate and it's going through the cave. And actually in Pyramid, this is what we have. <laughs> so in Pyramid, actually, you had this small platform and actually the platform where all the players are coming together and it transports you from the very bottom of the pyramid to the very top if you manage to find the exit. And so you've seen everything is super natural. And then what did we decide to do? Ha, teleport. We're going to say, but that's crazy. It's not natural, it's difficult. It's true. And that was probably the most difficult uh, decision we made. We're still arguing about it, saying it's, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, actually, we decided to keep it mainly for convenience for the partners, because if uh, you have a partner who has a smaller size, maybe two by two, not three by three, well, it's more difficult. We wanted to be able to accommodate. So we said, OK, we are still going to allow teleport in the game because it's going to be easier for actually operators to do it. But we've done something a bit different. I mean, if you are a VR expert, when you have a game with grabbing and teleporting, you will have your two button control. So basically, you're going to grab with your trigger and use your pie or joystick to teleport. What we've done is we actually implemented by default a one button control system, which means that actually on the trigger, you have both the grabbing and the teleporting. The way it works is if you have a, a, an object that you can grab and you put your hand close to it, it's going to be highlighted. You press the trigger, you grab it. And if you want to teleport, you need to point at the floor, maintain the trigger in, and you have a half a second delay. You see a line going on, and then you've got this blue uh, circle. And when you release it, you teleport. If you are a VR expert guy, when you try your game, you say, uh, your game is not working. I think there's a real problem with teleporting because I'm trying to do it. it. It takes some time. And it's true. But actually, if you are a very mainstream person who has never played, who has just 60 minutes to learn, who has never done video game, you can learn how to use one button in 60 minutes. You can't learn two. And actually, it really makes sure that for us, we've seen that everybody has been able to play the game, even though if they had no VR or no game experience. And what we do is for more experienced VR players in our tools for the, uh, for the partners. They can actually activate a by default two button if you want to, but it's not what we uh, advise as a, as, a main, uh, as a main control. And again, we, we've been very happy with uh, the choice we made on, on this level. <laughs> Finally, what we've put in the game is, um, because it's working really well with the Assassin's Creed in general, is this Eagle Vision. And basically, it's kind of replace the game master. So basically, when you are in the world and you're a bit lost, and it can happen in VR, especially when you've never done it, 
if you raise both your hand above your head with your controllers, we are going to highlight in the world what's important for you to touch or interact with if you want to solve your quest. And that's actually quite helpful because if you don't know, you do that and you kind of find your way through. So this is all the idea we had when we started Pyramid. Uh, we released it. Of course, uh, we had lots of feedback and we realized that everything was not perfect. There are lots of things that we could improve. And actually, we changed a couple of uh, things when we've been doing our, uh, our second game. The first thing we've done is we've staged the multiplayer differently. In Pyramid, basically, you start four in the lobby where you have character. Then we separate you to make sure that you feel the tension. And little by little, we put you back together as a group because you have this notion of coming back together, which is very satisfying. But by doing so, actually on some of the paths, you were two and you did not have the choice of what you could do. And it was bad because, for example, we have some climbing to do and we know how uh, uh, intensive can be climbing. Some people could not do it, but they had no choice. And that was really bad. So actually what we've done in Medusa is we have actually changed this so to make sure that at the beginning of every single stage, you start at four players, you see what's happening, and you can actually decide where you want to go. So if you don't want to climb, you don't have to do it. Then we can still split you because it's really satisfying to make some small group working together really well, but you have the choice at the very beginning. Also, one rule that we uh, applied is we keep the line of sight. So here on this uh, screenshot, it's from the view of one player. Just on your right, there is somebody climbing. And maybe you don't see really well, but on the other side, you have two other players hugging one another. So basically, even on this big level, the four players are always in sight. And why is it important? Because we realized from our first game is that when you're lost in VR, you feel really lost. You don't know what to do. If you have to wait, it's a really a bad experience. But as long as you can see the other players, you can actually talk to one another. They can actually help you. And basically, you never have the feeling that suddenly you've been on your own or you're not part of the group or it's different. And by making sure that at any single point, you can always see the people you always feel as a group, which is at the heart of what we want to do. One of the things also we've done is, so this uh, help system, you remember that we had, we actually made it optional. So it's actually actionable uh, from what we call the uh, spectator. Basically all the videos you've seen or the screenshot, it's the view that the partner has using our spectator mode, which is the tool. It's not made to be great looking. It's just made for the partner to see and to follow the way he wants to, all the different players, and is able to uh, act on the game. And he can uh, uh, activate or deactivate this help system if somebody wants a harder uh, game or, or, or a simple one. What we also change is the time of the experience. So uh, Pyramid, the average completion time is 44 minutes worldwide, and it was too short. Because when it's 44 minutes, I'll show you after, the distribution of playtime varies a lot depending on the groups and too many uh, people were able to finish it in less than 30 minutes, which, which is too short. So basically for uh, Medusa, the average uh, uh, playtime, completion time is 54 minutes and we think it's right now uh, the optimal time uh, in terms of satisfaction for the different partners. Finally, in Pyramid, you know, if, you do, if you've done some uh, escape games, at the end, as a team, you escape. People tell you, OK, come together as a team. We're going to take a nice photo. And it's a cool souvenir. And you can post it. It's really cool. So that's what we are doing in Pyramid. But in uh, Medusa, actually, we do it in game. So basically, uh, yeah, I know it's having a, a, an electronic photo in ancient Greece. It's, it, it's a bit daring. But actually, people love it. And it's a great memories. And then uh, partners can actually give that to their customers. Uh, they can share it, and it was something uh, positive. So this is what uh, uh, the part about more about the choice we made in terms of design. And what I want to talk to you now a bit more is about what the clients say, what our partners say, because we have this direct relation. So we talk a lot with them because we, we're actually learning a lot from the market. Uh, and actually, what does it reveal uh, for the market in general? So we, we have lots of data. We track how uh, players are playing and it gives us some 
interesting statistics. So for example, in terms of number of players, and I think we were surprised by this because if you look overall at our games, <coughs> you actually have more two-player sessions than four-player sessions. Uh, in escape room, so in traditional escape room uh, location, there's more four players, but in general, for example, in VR arcade, there's more two players. And I think what we realize is VR escape room is a fantastic uh, experience for couples. Uh, lots of people have the adventure together as a couple. And I really, uh, we're always saying uh, now to our partners, you know, think in your marketing to target couple to do something together because that's really something which is very strong, uh, which you can actually do uh, together. Uh, one of the things what I was mentioning before about uh, average uh, completion time is you can see the kind of distribution and the difference between actually Pyramid and uh, Medusa. And having this 54 minutes is really more optimal because you have very few uh, people who are able to finish before the 30 minutes where it feels a bit too much. And to actually help partners to manage this, we have a kind of leaderboard, which is not to encourage actually teams to be fast because we want people to uh, take advantage, but it's to be able to say somebody who's been very fast, look, you are among the best guy, so you're a great team. Don't be upset. I mean, you've done so well. I mean, we could not expect you to actually do so well. In terms of competition rate, uh, so there's more people who are finishing the game in escape rooms uh, location, but there's a but. We should not think that these people are actually more uh, efficient in doing it. It's just that uh, traditional escape rooms have a different approach to booking. So basically, often they don't have just a 60 minute time slot. Some want to have 75 or 90 minutes because their approach is to say, I want everybody to finish. I want to talk to them before. So they take more time and that's actually why uh, there is actually a bigger time because in general, there is a very similar uh, success uh, factor between one or the other. And then what we do, because we have this direct uh, relation with our different partners, we are doing lots of survey with them. So this one is a bit old uh, because it was done before the release of Medusa, but it's still uh, valid in terms of uh, information that had been uh, shared with, with us. So. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, in the survey, there's a split between escape room and VR arcade. We have just all been uh, answering about uh, our questions. So one of the first questions we asked them is, is the revenue in line with your expectation? So we were happy to see that 60% say yes, but actually you do realize that for 30, 35%, they say it was below expectation, uh, what they got as a, as a result. And so we were asking them, so why do you think it is below expectation? Uh, what, what, what can we do about it? So one of the comments we've got usually is the fact that uh, because we are two or four players, if you are, uh, especially if you're in an escape room, usually you bring groups of five, six people together, which you actually cannot do right now. And it makes sense because if you put six people instead of four, you're going to have a kind of better business. So we know it's not something we can do. But a lot of the comments are not so much related about this, are more related about, it's still very new. So we still need to communicate. We thought that just because it's VR, because you have a big brand, is going to pick up just like this. It's not the case. And actually, you uh, people sometimes uh, underestimate the effort you need to do to market actually VR and the experience outside of VR. And basically what, uh, we can really see that there is uh, not a general uh, uh, appeal and acceptance of VR. And there are very, lots of differences uh, per venues and per type of uh, consumers. And basically, you'd still need to uh, convince mainstream. But it's quite interesting because some of our partners are doing pretty well, uh, meaning that some VR arcade are really uh, because it's a bit different than their traditional model, which is a pay per minute. This is a pay per, per session, you book one hour, so it's something different for them. But some are really trying to emphasize the fact it's different from the typical VR arcade where you can get access to a big catalog of games, you come from a session. And the one who actually market this as an escape room, what they're telling us, it's super interesting for them because they are bringing in people who would never come actually to a VR arcade because they are not interested or they do not know about it because they don't have this, this term of acceptance, but they are interested by escape room. And if you like escape room, you like a challenge. So if it's in VR, it's okay, you can pick it up. But what they are saying is by doing so, actually this guy have discovered that VR is cool 
and some of them actually are coming back to the to the location. So there is an interest by entering by a kind of a different side to the market. So what we also ask them is, uh, uh, do you think you're going to increase the space dedicated to uh, VR escape room in your venue? Uh, and as you can see, lots of people were actually in favor of doing it. And actually, almost half of these people were people who mentioned before that the revenue was below their expectation. So we were a bit, uh, well, we are happy because we think it's better, but uh, we wanted to understand uh, why is that. And I think one of the reasons we've got is when we ask them, uh, is the um, uh, feedback that you've got from customers on the experience, is it in line with your expectation? Is it below or above? And actually, I think that's one of the uh, reasons is actually even though they played the game before, they know how they are, the feedback they got is actually excellent. And it really shows you that when VR is excellent, people are expecting, uh, are doing better. So they see that there is something there which is going to grow and get better over time. So actually, when you ask them, when we ask them, how bright do you see the uh, future for VR escape rooms? So it's on a scale from one to seven. You can see everybody's about four. And actually, almost 60% were saying that there is a real opportunity. And actually, something that I can say we've seen on the market, uh, and it's quite new, uh, because when we started two years ago, we never, we had never heard about this. But now we have many actually people saying, "I'm going to do an escape room business, but it's going to be solely with VR experience because we think it's a future. We think it's working, and actually, uh, now we have about 240 partners. Uh, eight of them are doing exclusively escape room in VR, and I think it's a trend which is going to uh, actually continue." Finally, I wanted to go maybe a bit beyond the uh, data. Uh, not that I have um, uh, certainty about how to market and address the consumers, uh, because it's still difficult. We still need to learn about it. But there's a couple of points which I think are interesting. And if you have some idea, I'm also interested to discuss after, uh, after, uh, after, that, um, after the, the talk with you to, to see what we can do. Uh, one of the first things we are always telling, especially escape room, is you need to explain people that VR is not a gaming console. I mean, you're not going to pay $30 to go and play on PlayStation outside your home. And that's still what lots of people believe. Uh, they don't understand that what we're doing are not video games, they are experiences. And it's fundamentally different. And when you are able to go beyond that, when people understand that this is the case, they have a very different relation to what VR is. And I think that's one of the challenges we've got is how do we communicate that? I don't have the solution. The one thing I know is we should not market it as a video game. So, uh, for example, I'm, I'm a bit at hardcore on this topic, but there's not one trailer of our games available outside. So what you've seen today are the only moving images that have been produced. So you have an idea, but because they don't properly relate what you do and what you see, it's always below. So I know that everybody wants to communicate and they say, we need a trailer, we need something. But I mean, our game is never going to look as good as the last uh, Assassin's Creed because it's the way it is. We are not a 2D game. So I don't have the solution, uh, but I think uh, we should not do that. We really need to market, uh, market it an, uh, as an experience because that makes a difference. And the one thing I've seen which is really, really working actually is you need to let people try. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, some of our uh, escape room are doing. When they finish a traditional one, they go back in the lobby where you have this character. They just put the headset. It can be 10 seconds, but in 10 seconds, the guy understands it's something different. Uh, and something similar I remember, which I thought was uh, very clever, uh, Survios in their uh, arcade, actually in uh, Torrance, what they had, they had a very nice arcade and it's giving on a big mall there on the street. You have a very big transparent uh, front window. And what they were putting just in front is uh, Richie's plank. And basically, you could see from the outside people doing, and basically tell you, what is this? That's very different. It's again going into the direction of uh, this is an experience and it's not just a video game. And that's what is making, uh, I think, uh, location based entertainment VR uh, actually successful. Um, so that's pretty much is, uh, everything I've got to share uh, with you today. 
Uh, I think if you have questions, uh, maybe we have a bit of time. Happy to answer them, or I can answer some uh, afterwards. Or you can send me an email. And uh, if you want to do VR, actually, we have lots of opportunities in Ubisoft Dusseldorf. It's really cool. Uh, and uh, if a French guy is telling you that it's cool to live in Germany, it, it's probably true. So, thank you very much. <laughs>